Good, you're very welcome. So this is the first lecture in a series with the general title Healthcare Ethics, Moral Principles and Clinical Practice. And our first session this evening, our topic is Core Principles of Healthcare, Core Principles of Ethical Healthcare. So that, that's what we're looking at this evening. Um, as I say, I've got some handouts for you and, and a reading list when we finish. And I'm glad that you're here from different fields of healthcare, diff different areas. Hopefully this will be relevant to all of you in some ways. And I'm going to look at healthcare ethics, especially towards the second half, from a Catholic Christian perspective. But I really do believe that the principles that we're looking at will be helpful for you, whatever your faith background or your philosophical background. Today we're looking at what I'm calling the core principles of ethical health care. I'm not trying to justify or defend them. It's too long. That, that we can have another session on that. I'm simply trying to present them as one approach to health care ethics and to see hopefully how helpful they are for you and that you appreciate it. But as I say, I'm not here at least in the, the initial presentation to defend each of these principles we can, we can thrash that out and have some good questions at the end so three sections here in our evening together part one, the vocation of the healthcare professional part two, general moral principles and part three special moral principles for healthcare so we're going to take a bit of time to actually get into what you've come for, which is healthcare principles. Okay. Part one, the vocation of the healthcare professional. So, the core conviction of the Catholic Christian approach to healthcare ethics is the dignity of the human person. The dignity of the human person, also known as the sanctity of life. But please note right at the beginning that when ethicists talk about sanctity of life, it's the traditional language, but it doesn't require you to have a religious point of view. Yes, it doesn't mean holiness in a religious sense, although, of course, sanctity and holiness is there in the theological tradition. Just the way that ethics, the ethics of healthcare, has come to speak about this has been in terms of human dignity and the sanctity of life. You're very welcome. What does this mean? That creation is good. This is a principle. It might be an obvious one, but it, it needs stating. That creation is good. That human life is good. That human life has intrinsic worth and value. Human life has intrinsic worth and value. That it is an end in itself. That the value of human life, this is built into the whole concept of the dignity of the human person, the sanctity of life, the value of human life is not dependent on other external criteria, how useful is my life to others, the value that others confer on me, what other people see in me, nor is the value of human life, of my life for example, dependent on internal criteria. What is the quality of my life? How intelligent am I? How able am I to be autonomous? Whether I have a strong desire to live or not? How strong my self-worth is? Etc. So there are in external criteria that affect me. There are internal subjective criteria. But my human dignity does not depend on these, ultimately. This view of human dignity does not depend on faith. It's really important. And in fact, as you know, it doesn't hardly need saying, it's got so much in common with secular human rights theory. Yeah? You have an objective human right. It might be legally conferred on you in a positivist law way, but, but the roots of, of your human rights are, are something fundamental. <clears throat> excuse me, fundamental and intrinsic. It's not just about you happen to be given them. 
But of course this view of human dignity and again to use the religious traditional language the sanctity of life is certainly strengthened by our faith as Christians. We believe as Christians that the universe was created by a loving good God. That creation is good. That human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. That there is a transcendent cause to everything and to each human life. And that there is a meaning and a dignity and a destiny to each human life, to each human person. Okay. So here is our core conviction, the starting point of an ethical health care, the dignity of the human person, the sanctity of life. What does this mean? Well it means, because remember we're in part one now, what is our vocation as healthcare professionals? It means that first of all we have a duty not to use human beings as a means to an end not to instrumentalize them because human beings are ends in themselves not just means to another end we have a duty to do no harm what does that mean we'll come on to that in part three we have a duty to care for the person because of their intrinsic dignity and their worth and just in brackets this is a holistic view of the human person the human person as in the Catholic Christian understanding body and soul as mind and heart and feelings and wishes and conscience including health but the holistic view of the human person and at last with those if you like anthropological principles in place those principles of what it means to be human we, we've arrived at the vocation of the healthcare professional the meaning of, the health, of healthcare which is I'm sorry it's so boring what is the meaning of healthcare it is to care for health right, so there's your first takeaway what is the meaning of healthcare in an ethical sense it is to care for someone's health of course I'm being a bit flippant and this is what the whole of this evening is about but to see that health your health and bodily integrity are intrinsic goods because they're part of what it means for you to be human your human dignity so health and bodily integrity are intrinsic goods but they're not absolute goods so we're kind of clarifying a bit now for example we'll come on to this later as well in some cases it is allowable to refuse treatment that might help your health in some cases it's allowable to sacrifice your life for another for a greater good in some cases it's acceptable to take risks with your life because you believe there is a greater good and we'll come on to all these things later but we've gone from the dignity of the human person to the, the simple simplistic care for someone's health and bodily integrity but just to note that health and bodily integrity are intrinsic goods but not absolute goods another way of putting this is that in Catholic language we are against the principle of vitalism vitalism is the idea that you must keep life going at any cost any cost to the person to society to their happiness to their well-being to their faith anything so we are not vitalists and this is a misconception that people often throw at Catholic ethics human dignity also implies the freedom and to a great extent it's not absolute but the freedom and the autonomy of the individual dignified person the principles of all things being equal freedom self-determination autonomy the rights to follow your conscience of the patient 
Okay, so we've talked about dignity and health, but part of that, again, intrinsic to the person I'm speaking to, whose health I'm concerned about, is not just their health, but their autonomy and their freedom and their self-determination as a human being with dignity, of the, the patient. Remember, this is not absolute, again, a qualification, because we need to seek the best interests of the person and we might dispute what best interests are and as Catholic Christian healthcare professionals we would believe that there is an, obje an objective aspect to best interests best interests is not just subjective so you have a right to self-determination all things being equal but it doesn't mean that your understanding of your own best interests will actually be in your best interests. Lots of issues here. But again, as a default, all things being equal, the healthcare professional and the healthcare system wants to respect the freedom, the rights, the autonomy of the patient. But also part of human dignity is that the healthcare practitioner has dignity and autonomy and self-determination and a conscience and a responsibility to follow their conscience it's very interesting and just to put in almost brackets here this is really a, a bigger topic but, but the, the, the obligation of the healthcare professional um, to be a good healthcare professional not just to be a good ethicist so the healthcare professional needs professionalism they need to be good at their job but they also need character and virtue because you cannot just be um, an automaton, a, a, a mechanistic practitioner. Part of your, your practice is about relationships between the healthcare practitioner and the patient. So there's, a, there's an aspect of relationship which requires virtue and love and respect, etc. But also many of the decisions you're making require wisdom and prudence because you cannot just go to a rule book we're going to talk about some ethical principles but there's great scope for wisdom and disagreement and the virtue of prudence so you need to be a good professional and a wise virtuous loving prudent character so character as well as professionalism and this is true of many professions Okay, so we've gone fairly quickly through part one, the, the core foundational principle of healthcare ethics, the dignity of the human person, the sanctity of human life, and, and some of the things that that involves. Okay, I keep flicking through my slides because I have to remind myself what I put on slides and what I haven't. Part two then. Even before we get into healthcare, let's do something about general moral principles. So this is like if you've done philosophy A level or something, this is, this is revision for you. General moral principles. <clears throat> At, Liz, do you mind doing me a favour? Do you mind getting me a glass of water from downstairs? I know you know where things are. Thanks very much. <clears throat> So you, you do this at school, right? One of the things you learn, I'm going to race through this because I'm getting to a point at the end of this. One of the things you learn is ethical theories. And often you learn them as if they're rigid and tidy and incompatible. So I'm going to put on the board now five ethical theories. I'm, I'm hardly going to explain them, but just to highlight them. Five ethical theories, and you'll often find these in a textbook. One is natural law. The idea that there are objective goods built into nature, and it's part of our nature to seek the good, and to seek what is truly and objectively good, because of the kind of persons that we are, and because of the kind of world that we live in. Natural law. Secondly, deontology. Deon means duty. So deontology is about the ethics of duty, 
law and rules. So you can develop a whole moral system on the idea of doing your duty and following the rules and obeying the law. Okay? Thirdly, utilitarianism. Utilitarianism. Or consequentialism. Utilitarianism. The idea that the results or the consequences of your actions are the primary criteria for making moral judgments. So I do this thing in itself. It's got lots of different consequences. Thanks very much, Liz. Hello, welcome. Great to see you. I do this action. It's got meaning in itself, but I'm less interested in the meaning in itself, and I'm, I'm more interested in all the practical consequences, and I add up the good that comes out of this. Will there be more good, more happiness, more health in the world as a result of this? Utilitarianism. Fourth, virtue ethics. The focus here is not so much on what's done out there or what the consequences are. It's, it's on the character of the person acting. The virtuous character. So how do I become the kind of person who is acting well in the world and growing in wisdom and love and prudence so that I will make good choices as I do my actions? Virtue ethics. And fifthly, I put the heading here, the ethics of autonomy. If you read someone like Charles Taylor, he might talk about, about romanticism, not meaning romantic falling in love, but the the 18th, 19th century philosophical sense of romanticism where it's about the, the feelings and the outlook of the individual on the world. The ethics of auth- autonomy where the focus is on the freedom of the individual, the autonomy, the self-creation of the individual as they act in the world and respond to the world. Okay. So you do this at school, there's your textbook, it's very interesting, you can bounce these ideas around as if they're rival theories. I want to make a very simple point that I believe that your, your standard, solid, Catholic, Christian ethical approach is actually to incorporate all these theories in a holistic way. And we need them all, actually. We need elements from them all. And I would say, and I could go on in a deep philosophical way, but I won't, that in fact each of these theories only makes sense if it's in relationship to the others. So, to go through how would I build up a Catholic, Christian ethical approach to anything not just healthcare I would want to say going through the list of five theories here first of all yes, like in natural law we believe as as healthcare practitioners in to use the traditional language objective good and evil now just a little note about evil evil doesn't mean demons and spirits and the exorcist evil is just the traditional way of talking about what is wrong malum the bad, the wrong, the thing that is not good so get, get rid of the idea I will fall back into this language because it's very traditional good and evil but please get rid of the idea of spooks and demons and devils this is about right and wrong and we're just using traditional language so The Catholic approach, first of all, yes, there's an objective right and wrong to some actions. There are natural goods. Some things have value in themselves, like the creation, like human life, like order and beauty and, 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 well, life, not just human life, life. Um, Some things have value in themselves not just because they are useful for a a further purpose and some actions are good in themselves doesn't mean you should always do them we'll come on to that but to feed the hungry is a good thing to do to clothe the naked is a good thing to do it's good because naturally 
this is what human beings need and naturally we are made to help each other some things are intrinsically good some, tr- some things are intrinsically evil because of the nature and the world the nature of what it means to be human and the nature of what it means to, to love one another the end doesn't justify the means and this flows into principle 2 but I'll leave it into principle 1 here that we should never do something that is intrinsically evil meaning an action that in itself is wrong we should never do no matter how good the consequences seem to be we should not torture someone to get information out of them that might help us in the future if I'm in a lifeboat with miles from the shore and we're dying of hunger I should not kill my passenger my fellow survivor in order to eat his flesh so that I can survive it's a good thing to survive it's a good thing to eat it's not a good thing intrinsically to kill my neighbour my fellow human being Okay. second principle for, for Catholic Christians and healthcare yes we have a duty we have some duties yes deontology we have a duty to do good to do no harm there are many moral principles and we'll go into some of them um, there, are, there are some very detailed moral principles that will really help us there are some broad principles that we have in our Christian tradition Jewish Christian tradition the Ten Commandments and we get some key ethical principles like do not murder um, do not commit adultery the, these things are wrong in themselves in the natural law sense but from this we get a sense of duty and law and order and principle and obligation and rights so there's a deontological framework here which is important thirdly yes in, in, in a Catholic Christian ethical framework we do need to consider consequences yes we need to think about the effects of our actions we always need to take this into account it might not be the ultimate criteria in every case but it's always important to think about it we need to think about the side effects the clear direct initial consequences the long term effects we know are going to happen the the very very long term effects that are probable or even possible or even unlikely but maybe we need to think about what's intended what's unintended the risks the knock on effects all of this is what utilitarianism does very well and it's important it might not be absolute but it's important fourth principle yes we believe in virtue because we do in general believe that it's good to be virtuous and loving and kind and forgiving so we believe in virtue but specifically in terms of discernment of right and wrong and as we'll get on to in healthcare ethics we need prudence we need practical wisdom because sometimes the principles, the rules, the objective rights and wrongs won't tell us what to do in this hard case and we need the experience of living through this the experience and the wisdom of the church of our fellow practitioners of our mentors sometimes things are grey and messy often acts are good or neutral but the circumstances will will determine whether it's right or wrong to do them and we need real wisdom sensitivity experience data practice character so yes we believe in virtue ethics and finally yes as Catholics um, as as Christian healthcare ethicists we believe as I've said in the dignity of the person and therefore the dignity of their own freedom and autonomy and self-determination we are not just robots it's important to respect the, the personal journey and growth of the individual their their autonomy their if you like self-realization this is the ethics of autonomy you could say it's a it's a very modern romanticized view of the human person it's it's not absolute but it's important 
And also, let's put this under the same heading, we need to recognise the, the reality of pluralism, that, that we live in a society where people will have different views of fulfilment and of the common good and of what is in my best interests. And some of those differences, as Catholic healthcare professionals, we can allow for. Not all of them. Yeah, if you say, um, I feel it's in my best interests to kill myself this evening, I can't support you in that. Um, but we might have legitimate disagreements about best interests, and I might have to say, all things being equal, even though I'm not sure, and maybe I do disagree about you, I think it's better that you do follow your conscience in this area. So there's a, there's, there's an, a sense of... OK, I'll, I'll stop there in, in that fifth point. Let me summarise then. What, what's the Catholic ethical approach to decision-making and to right and wrong... Well, it's to, to hold in mind, and we'll need to go into more details in a minute, all these different aspects of the five most common ethical theories and to realise that they all have a place and they've all got something important to say. And how do we hold them together? And then the final part of part two so we've gone through some health, we've gone through some ethical principles, I've said they're all important, I want to do something quite niche now before going on to actual healthcare principles I want to speak about understanding quote, the act right, sounds a bit technical, the act meaning what is a moral action and, and we need to do this because we're going into a little bit of detail when we start talking about actual principles. And if you don't get this framework, then it won't make sense. Okay. Understanding the act. Put it another way. What is happening when something happens? What is happening when something happens? If we want to understand what makes an action good, we need to understand the various elements that can make something good or bad. And I'll say at the beginning what I'll say at the end, so that we've bracketed my, my um, schema. If the act in itself is wrong, nothing can make it good. This is one of the core principles. If the act in itself is wrong, nothing can make it good. No goal, no circumstances, no motivation, no reason, no justification, no end can make this thing good if the act in itself is wrong. I've given some examples. Whatever the consequences, you cannot torture someone. Nothing will make torture right. Whatever the consequences, you cannot kill an innocent child directly and intentionally. However good the consequences. Second principle, if an act in itself is a good thing or morally neutral, then it may be good to do it, but it may not. I'll say that again. If an act in itself is a good thing or is morally neutral, then it may be good to do it, but it may not. And that depends on the circumstances, the motivations, the consequences, the side effects, and all the principles. It sounded very abstract what I just said, didn't it? Let me give a simple example. I've given it already. Yes? Is it a good thing in itself to feed the hungry? Yes, that's a good act in itself. But does it mean if you see a hungry person, you should always feed them? No, it doesn't. Because if you're in a war zone and you see a hungry person, you might be saving the life of someone who's dying. 
So you decide not to feed the hungry person because they can be hungry for another six hours while you save the life of this person on the operating table in front of you. Yeah? There might be someone hungry here because they haven't eaten for a day. There might be someone dying of malnutrition next door to me. So I feed the person dying of malnutrition first, don't I? Not just the hungry person who skipped a meal. So there's something good in itself, but I still need to work out whether it's good to actually step in and do this moral act. Right, here's a schema about the moral act. This is very abstract. I don't apologise for it. I find it quite interesting myself. Whether you do or not depends on how geeky you are and how philosophical your mind is, but you will see how important it is. Right, what, what goes on in an, a moral action, a moral act? First of all, the act itself. The what. The act itself. This is the core moral description. Another way, it's slightly muddled this language, it's the direct intrinsic effect of what's going on. The core moral description. What am I actually doing here? To use technical language, it's called the finis operis. The finis operis, meaning the goal, the end, of the act itself. Or to give you even more confusing language, it's sometimes called the objective intention. Okay? Very abstract. Let's give some simple examples. The what? I am telling a lie. I am telling a lie. It's sunny outside. I say to you, it is raining. I am telling something that is not truth, that contradicts reality. I am lying to you. That is the act, the moral act itself, the what. I am, different example, killing an innocent person. A thousand reasons, a thousand consequences, a thousand effects, but what am I actually doing? I am killing an innocent person. Let's give some positives. I am feeding a hungry person. I am speaking the truth. Yeah? The core of the moral act, the what. Second aspect of the act is the circumstances. I've called this, just to be clever, the where. I don't just mean physically, where is it taking place? I mean, what's the context, the big where? What's going on? What are the circumstances at every level? If I'm, if I'm lying to you, what's the circumstances? I'm lying, I am lying here to you, you're there. It's this time, there's this reason, there's these, these circumstances. Um, I won't give you too many random examples, but you can just imagine that. Yeah, there's loads of circumstances that, that are in the background, in the foreground, for me speaking to you and telling you this lie. The circumstances. Thirdly, there's what I'm calling here the direct consequences. The direct consequences. The, the what for. Okay, I'm lying to you, but what for? What for? It might be short term, it might be long term. It might be known, it might be unpredictable. I might be uncertain. But I'm, I'm doing this thing in these circumstances. What for? What's the direct consequences? Fourthly, there's the indirect side effects. The indirect side effects... I've called this the what else. I'm doing this. I know this is going to happen. Oh, and by the way, these other things happen as a consequence. The, the side effects. And what makes them side effects rather than direct consequences? Well, I'm not doing this thing in order to bring these things about. They're coming about, as it were, accidentally. Ordinary languages, the side effects. In that sense, they're indirect. And the fifth element, there are others, but I'm simplifying here. We'll call this the motivation. The subjective intention 
of the one who acts the motivation or the subjective intention and remember I'm calling it subjective intention because I confused you earlier by saying that there is an objective intention to an act meaning what's actually happening and I've called this the why why am I doing why am I lying to you I'm lying to you because I want to get away quickly now the why the motivation it might be the same as the consequences yes but it might be the consequences of the consequences I might be also, I might be really muddled about why I'm doing this it might be very subjective it might be very guesswork but there is always a reason why and somehow that why will connect with what I think are the consequences of what's happening why did they do this right very abstract now let's give some examples I'll, I'll race through these because I want to get onto the principles but just you've got there the five principles of the act let me go through three examples really quickly one I say to my boss I'm sick but really I'm going on holiday I'm doing a sickie right what's going on here the act is lying the circumstances I need a holiday I've got a terrible boss I'm sick of work yeah it's all circumstances the direct consequences I get my holiday I don't have to take unpaid leave I avoid my boss the side effects well my work has to get in some temporary staff maybe my, my, my projects are unfulfilled for a week my house is empty someone might break into my house that's a side effect of me being on holiday what's my motivation well it's to rest it's to see my friends on holiday it's to save my money by not having to take unpaid leave at work which is why I'm lying now I've raced through that what's the objective act lying yeah however much I need a holiday however much my boss doesn't mind however much I've set my alarm system up at home they've got some good supply employees for me um, however much um, I've just seen a TV program about how everyone takes a sickie nothing can make it right because lying is wrong lying is intrinsically wrong so the circumstances the, the subjective motivation the, the side effects none of that makes it right ok second example in war yes I choose as a commander to bomb innocent civilians in em enemy territory right what's the act killing innocent human beings what's the circumstances I'm at war my enemy has been bombing my innocent civilians in our country we're losing the ground war this feels like the only thing we can do what's the consequences it terrorizes other civilians so that they want to stop the war it shows them it's a demonstration of our power what's the side effects ecological disaster perhaps historic cities devastated what's the motivation to frighten the citizens perhaps so that the political leaders give in to public demand to stop the war and surrender yeah this is common this happened in the second world war is it justified no no you cannot directly choose to kill innocent human beings now we can have another discussion about how sometimes innocent human beings as it were accidentally get killed as a result of targeted attacks on military facilities etc and there's a lot of greyness in between but you cannot intentionally choose to go out and kill innocent civilians nothing will justify it it's a wrong in itself final example a heart transplant is that a good thing yes in itself it's a good thing if someone's heart is about to fail it's not a good thing if you've got a good heart your heart's about to fail you have a healthy heart given to you it's a good thing in itself 
the circumstances, a donor is available, you're about to die, your loved ones want you to have it, the hospital can do it. The consequences, a probable life extension. You contribute more taxes if you work for longer. These are consequences. The side effects, the heart is not given to someone else. The opportunity costs. What's the motivation? Well, for your family, if they're paying for it, it, it's out of love for you and to keep you alive. For the NHS, it's maybe to keep, to, to make their quotas of people living for longer hours. It, it's maybe to practice the, the, the heart transplant techniques of their staff. It's complicated. Does it mean that you always do a heart transplant if you can? No. A heart transplant on an unhealthy heart is always a good thing in itself but it doesn't mean you will always do it because that might depend on circumstances on side effects on, on motivations etc etc I'll repeat what I said if the act in itself is wrong nothing can make it good if an act in itself is a good thing or morally neutral it may be good to do it but we need to think about all the other aspects before we make a decision. Okay. Right. Part three. Special moral principles for healthcare. We finally got to the reason you came this evening. And I'm just going to list some principles. There's about, is it seven or eight? I can't remember. Um, I'll give you the heading I've got this on the notes for you to take away and I'll just spend two or three minutes talking about each one just to make sure you've understood it but as I say I'm not trying to convince you of all these things we can have some discussion if you agree or disagree in the question time I'm trying to present them to you and not even go into great detail but just so that you know these are some principles that you can draw on and that you really should find out more about even if you disagree with them you know that they're part of our tradition and I hope they're helpful A the duty the vocation to care for the health of the patient first of all health care is about caring for someone's health and that we have a duty and a vocation as healthcare professionals to do that. It means to care, all things being equal, for the health of the patient and to preserve their physical life in so far as it's possible with the other principles that follow in mind. But this is the starting point. This is part of the Hippocratic Oath. Quote, I will use treatments for the benefit of the sick in accordance with my ability and my judgment and I will do no harm or injustice to them I will use treatments for the benefit of the sick my vocation, my duty as a healthcare professional is to help the health to benefit the health to care for the health and the, the physical integrity and the life and the, the well-being of this person all things being equal and I'd add into this first principle the obligation of basic care to meet the basic needs of this person in health care our duty and their rights their human rights to receive basic care including shelter food, water protection from harm and if I don't meet their basic care this is the wrongdoing the sin of neglect now lots of controversy which we won't go into now about exactly what's basic care in the hard cases I know that's a controversial question but just let's go from the big principles to the little ones right A point A the, the vocation to care for the health of the patient point B do no harm do no harm 
part of the Hippocratic Oath I've just read, I will do no harm or injustice to my patients. We should, in other words, in, in the Catholic Christian understanding, avoid acts that are intrinsically evil. An act, as I've said, that is wrong in itself, that's always and everywhere wrong, we should clearly avoid. For example, direct abortion. For example, euthanasia. For example, lying to patients. For example, falsifying records to meet targets. Lying to a patient, even if it's, you think, to cause them less distress, is wrong in itself. Having a direct abortion, facilitating a direct abortion, even though the circumstances may, for you, seem as if it's helping someone, um, because it is something that in itself is wrong should not be done however compassionate it seems however difficult the circumstances are and it requires huge amounts of compassion and, and love and sensitivity I'm not oversimplifying this at all but just as, as healthcare professionals as Catholic ethicists there are certain markers and we believe that some things in themselves are right and some things some things in themselves are wrong and we should never do them I won't go into right, we've done that already some things are right in themselves but it doesn't mean we should always do them ok that's principle B do no harm principle C the principle of totality sometimes called the therapeutic principle I need to explain this of course the principle of totality or the therapeutic principle. All things being equal, I must not harm your body. But for the sake of your holistic health, I may need to do something that in itself is harmful. Obvious things. It's not good to take out a kidney, but if you have a cancerous kidney, it's good to take it out because I'm doing something that in itself is not good I don't mean morally, good, morally wrong but just it's not a good thing to take a kidney out unless you're doing that for the sake of the holistic totality of the person's well-being it's not good to cut off a limb but I might amputate a gangrenous limb to save your life it's not good to offer your kidney to someone else in itself to take a kidney out of yourself is not a good thing but you might do it for the sake of saving someone else's life in, in an emergency transplant the goal in other words is to preserve life life the holistic life of the person and sometimes you might need to do something not good not a great thing in itself doing damage basically not moral damage but damage harm for the sake of the greater good but the principles here I didn't put them on the board you must never sacrifice a lower function except for the better functioning of the person of the whole as a whole it's kind of obvious isn't it you can do a small harmful thing for the sake of the whole person and secondly that you shouldn't sacrifice the fundamental capacities of the human person to maintain life you shouldn't sacrifice the fundamental capacities of the human person to maintain life in other words if what you're doing is a direct attack on the whole person's way of being human you know you're, you're doing something to the brain which is making them never be able to think and feel and, and function again um, you're, you're doing more harm in the long term than, in the, than the good that's being done so you're, you're trying to keep the integrity of the whole you're trying to save the health and the life and the well-being of the whole person and to keep their, their integrity as a person the parts are subordinate to the whole in other words D, the fourth principle 
the distinction between killing and letting die the distinction between killing and letting die to let someone die doesn't mean that you are killing them there's a difference and I'm not going to go into this very much I'm just saying take this principle away and work out what it means and read more about it the key question is what you're actively doing is this killing the person or what as it were you're actively not doing are you withdrawing um, some basic care that is a neglect where your neglect is killing the person because sometimes to to withdraw treatment or not to treat someone the, the, the overall effect is that this person is dying but they're dying not because of your neglect they're dying because they're sick yes, obvious examples here someone um, has liver cancer they're very near the end of their life they're offered a transplant they decide that they don't want to have a liver transplant that's their right to, to decide not to have that treatment because it's a serious treatment it's an invasive treatment um, they're, they're not killing themselves is that euthanasia to refuse a liver transplant no it's not is this person killing themselves no are they refusing treatment yes what's killing them the cancer not their decision not to have the treatment it's different from starving someone to death yeah you're not dying of your cancer you might be dying of you might be dying of cancer and very near death yes but who knows are you going to live for another week or another month but if I stop feeding you and, and withdraw um, fluids from you with the intention to kill you what is killing you not the cancer but the, the neglect of not giving you basic care so again I'm not going into all the details of this there's no time we can talk about it in the questions but I'm just saying in, in Catholic medical ethics we need to see not to be naive and say oh someone is dying or has died therefore it is automatically the case that they have been killed very simple distinction the difference between killing and letting die and sometimes it is morally permissible to let someone else or myself die E principle 5 the principle of double effect the principle of double effect this is the distinction between the positive effect the active positive effect of what I'm doing if you like the main effect and the indirect side effect of what I'm doing I'm using the language slightly loosely but I'll leave it there the main positive effect and the indirect side effect and the principle of double effect is that if there are good reasons for doing a good thing which is the main positive effect of what I'm doing sometimes it's allowable to allow some negative side effects for example it's not good to lose your hair but you might accept that when you have chemotherapy you will have some hair loss yeah? you don't do the chemotherapy in order to lose hair it's a side effect um, it's what we call double effect if you tell me I'm taking a drug in order to lose hair I think well you're a bit crazy but that's not a good thing but if you say I'm having chemotherapy to beat my cancer and the double effect the unwished for but accepted side effect of that is I'm losing my hair I accept that just to give you some hard cases sometimes if I'm in a just war I might need to bomb an armament factory and tragically I know that there may be some civilian casualties nearby yeah? I've decided for a host of other criteria that this is necessary and just I believe it is a morally good action to take out this armaments factory and as a 
unintended side effect I recognise that there may be some civilian casualties but I'm not bombing the civilians intentionally in order to kill them so this is the principle of double effect and it's allowable if the act in itself is not evil you're trying to do a good thing and you're not doing an evil thing as a means to a good end and the evil the bombing of the civilians the losing the hair is not the reason for you doing this thing the intention and also there needs to be a proportionate reason I've listed this in your notes and also there needs to be no good alternative that you could have done instead yes if you can beat the cancer in a much simpler cheaper easier way why are you having this expensive chemotherapy and losing your hair you do it because it, it feels necessary and as a last resort look into this I, I've done the principle of double, epe, double effects in four minutes it's really important you can see how important it is and how necessary it is sometimes principle F three more we're nearly finished cooperation with evil cooperation with evil meaning sometimes it seems unavoidable to be involved in things that we morally disagree with yes for example I may be against on principle nuclear weapons but I live in a country where I have to pay taxes and I know that some of my taxes are going to support nuclear weapons and trident I'm a cleaner in a hospital and I know that my hospital is doing abortions and indirectly I'm contributing to that this is called in the broadest sense cooperation with evil meaning I'm, I, it seems that I'm unavoidably involved in something that I don't think is right now look in principle it's good not to cooperate in wrong things in principle but is it sometimes necessary and allowable well here's some criteria I have to give you some more jargon I'm afraid you, again I'm, I'm not trying to I realise I've given you so much it's all in the notes go away and look it up but at least you've heard it once in one tight session the distinction between formal and material cooperation formal cooperation means I want this evil thing to happen I'm doing it because I want it to happen meaning that formally the form the shape of this act the, the, the this thing is being done because I want it to happen I'm doing it so it can happen or yes I agree with the person that I'm helping to do this thing I like what they're doing formal cooperation is always wrong because in effect you're doing something that is wrong in itself or you're helping someone to do something that's wrong in itself because you want it to happen you're completely involved in, in wrongdoing okay material cooperation is I'm not doing this because I want the terrible result to come about I'm assisting in an action I'm assisting it's material because the the actions that I'm doing are contributing to this act happening but I don't actually want the act to happen I'm contributing I'm connected with this I'm assisting I'm paying taxes and the bombs are being made I'm selling fertilizer in a shop and I know that some terrorists maybe are going to make bombs out of this fertilizer I'm not selling it in order that they make bombs but I, I know that indirectly this is happening and the final distinction here is that direct material cooperation is wrong yeah you come to me and say I want to make a bomb will you sell me some fertilizer yeah now I may not want you to make the bomb but if, if I give, sell you the fertilizer I jolly well know that I'm in effect directly helping you to make a bomb aren't I if, if you're a, a, 
a gang member and I know you're a gang member and I know you're in a feud with someone and you come and want to buy a kitchen knife off me I can't pretend I don't know that you're going to use this knife to go and knife someone else I'm, I'm directly materially cooperating you cannot do that that's never right but can I run a hardware shop a kitchen shop and sell knives knowing that some of these knives might end up in the hand of teenagers in gangs who are murdering each other in the London streets well you can you might want to be a bit more careful you might want to do some background checks but you're indirectly materially cooperating okay formal cooperation is always wrong direct material cooperation basically helping someone to do wrong even if you don't want to do it is always wrong but indirect material cooperation I don't want this to happen I'm not directly doing this but I know there's some complicated chain of effects where, where yes, yes I know I'm indirectly contributing sometimes that's allowable and you can see the bearing on healthcare principle G the criteria of when to treat or when not to treat or when to withdraw treatment so this is like a clarification of the earlier principle yeah the criteria well I'm just going to list this right there it is on the board when should I treat when should I not treat when should I withdraw treatment you need to consider these factors it's not exhaustive and again I'm just giving you this so that you know it's there and you can go off and look into this more deeply we need to think about the probable benefits to the patient health, success of treatment, length of life how burdensome it is the costs, the pain, the suffering the likelihood of success how burdensome it is to society to the NHS to the family not just to the patient the probable benefits of those close to the patient do they have dependent young children that's, that's a factor the probable benefits to wider society it's not the only reason yeah. do I treat you if you're going to pay your taxes and be a good citizen That's, no but in fact in a holistic way yes your well-being as an individual and in society is part of what I weigh up do we refuse chemotherapy to some people because it's such a burden on them they're near the end of life they've had seven rounds of chemotherapy already etc 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 maybe they will choose to refuse for one of these reasons or more can the NHS ration treatment yes it has to it doesn't have infinite funds it has to use these criteria and others can you, would you refuse antibiotics for someone who's dying who's young um, and otherwise healthy and has a dependent family and has the whole of their life ahead of them you'd be mad to refuse the antibiotics wouldn't you and quite possibly probably wrong to refuse them yeah so there's some principles and the final principle this is a whole other talk is the Christian attitude to suffering and death yes we want to relieve suffering as far as possible to have compassion and kindness this is part of the corporal works of mercy it's Jesus' injunction to care for the sick but we also recognise that suffering is part of our fallen world that it's not always avoidable that we cannot solve everything and sometimes we need to accept when it is impossible to avoid suffering to ourselves or to others and to see um, in the light of faith I would never impose this on anyone but in the light of faith, light of faith a spiritual meaning to suffering the possibility of offering up one's suffering of, of growing in humility and holiness and understanding and compassion for others of living a life of penance again these are not ends in themselves these are not the whole story but they're one part 
of what suffering can mean in a holistic Christian perspective. And it's the same for death. Yes, all things being equal, we try to avoid it. But we need to accept when the time comes. Death is not an absolute evil. And death is not the final end for the Christian. There can be dignity in death. Not the false dignity of euthanasia, but genuine dignity. We believe in the triumph of Christ over death. We believe in the hope of eternal life. We have a holistic view of caring for someone in their suffering, of caring for their health, but helping them to face suffering and death when those things are unavoidable. This is, in broad terms, what's called, in a lovely phrase, an old-fashioned traditional phrase, the art of dying well. How we can face suffering and death well when they are unavoidable. And trusting in God's love for us, in God's providence, in God's love for the sick and the dying person, and in God's love for us and all those in healthcare who are trying to help them. Okay? Whew. Right. Very dense. Loads of principles. Lots of geeky schemas. Yes? I've, I've purposely gone quickly and I wanted to cram everything, not everything, huge amounts in terms of headings and bullet points and little tasters into this first lecture evening so that you've heard some of the language, you can go and look up some of this and you can spend the next, well the rest of your life applying it, but particularly that in the next three weeks, the following, this is week one, week two, three and four we're going to go back into lots of these principles with the help of the team from the Amscombe Centre. So thanks for your patience and um, we can have some good discussion now.